Okay, I'm just going live. It shows that your microphone's on. Okay, I'll be right there. Yeah. It does too, yep. Yeah. Computer off. Do you want me to do this too, sure? It just helps for everybody to hear because okay. they don't have our mics on. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Great, great. Good morning. Um, I am going to call this meeting to order at 10.06. Thank you very much. It's a continuation basically from yesterday. And um, I've, I've learned I don't have to say everything I said yesterday, so that's terrific. Uh, I do have to state that this electronic meeting is being held in accordance with section 238 of the Municipal Act 2001 due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I can actually verbally um, confirm that all members um, of the planning committee are here. We can see everybody and we can also see everybody from the OP review steering committee. So I am confirming that for you, Madam Clerk. Okay, um, and uh, just to advise again that public input to this meeting was invited at the following email address, planning at muskokalakes.ca. Uh, motions have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite the meeting and voting will be, um, we're going to go with, I think the physical voting, we're voting with your hand up in front of you, um, please. And, that is, uh, there is no supplementary agenda today. So that's good in any disclosure of any pecuniary interest. No, okay, great. All right, I have a motion uh, to uh, move us out of our formal, more formal uh, uh, state. It's moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Zavitz. Be it resolved that pursuant to section two, 3.2 of the Township's Procedural Bylaw 2019-079. The rules of uh, procedure are hereby suspended for the duration of the official plan review policy directions workshop and that they be reinstated at the conclusion of the workshop. Uh, any questions, comments? All in favor? That carries yes. unanimously. unanimously, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we had an introduction by Mr. Pink yesterday, and as this is a continuation of the meeting, I think we're gonna try and just move right back into um, letting uh, either um, Mr. Diamond or, or I, I think I see him um, carry on with, uh, with our review and um, just get right into it. So Jim, if you'd like to take it over. Um, actually, I'll uh, start off if that's okay, Councillor uh, Bridgman. Uh, we were playing a bit of a tag team today as we did yesterday. Um, I wanted to indicate that uh, we all thought yesterday went very well and we're looking forward to continuing that uh, today. Uh, before getting into the policy directions, I uh, just wanted to review how we think the rest of this meeting will go. Uh, we'd like to try to get through as many or all of the remaining policy directions uh, in this meeting today, but we also want to leave time at the end to discuss any other issues, uh, any other thoughts for additional policy directions, uh, discuss how and if and when uh, we come back uh, in any form to discuss anything over again or to obtain confirmation uh, that we've got it right before it goes out to the public. So something to think about. And then lastly, as indicated yesterday, uh, we'd like to canvas the group uh, and get uh, people's thoughts on how we should be going out to the public when we do, uh, given we have these challenging times and cannot do in-person meetings, at least at this point. Uh, so with that being said, uh, and unless there are any questions, I'd like to launch right into the policy directions. Forgive me for interrupting. Um, Laurie, Laurie uh, do you know how to raise your hand electronically on Zoom? Because you weren't here yesterday. It's in the participant screen. That's, that's if you'd like to speak, uh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. 
Great. So I'm going to just keep on going and uh, uh, with policy direction number five, um, it deals with cumulative environmental impacts. Uh, when the district's official plan was updated, uh, a fairly brief uh, section was included within the district's plan dealing with this issue. Generally speaking, most official plans focus on the impacts of whatever is proposed in front of you. So if someone makes an application, uh, impacts are assessed, they're considered, and a decision is made. Uh, the idea of looking at cumulative impacts is that you sometimes look beyond uh, the individual uh, site that may be under development, and you take into account the potential impacts of other things that might be happening in the area. It's kind of a conceptual uh, thing, um, but your official plan does not include uh, any uh, there, any clear policy on cumulative impacts. And we're thinking that there should be some direction in the official plan to allow for the consideration of cumulative impacts at the appropriate time. Uh, we think that's a positive thing uh, and certainly allows for broader reviews in case there is a need for a broader review uh, going down in, in the future. So there are uh, a number of policies in your OP already dealing with environmental impact studies. They pretty much focus simply on the site, as I indicated, there are extensive policies in your official plan that deal with natural areas. And what we're suggesting is that consideration be given to adding another lens uh, to the approval process as necessary in the future. So that's all I had to say about that particular policy direction. We think it's fairly straightforward, but would appreciate any discussion or comments on that. Thank you, Patricia, I see you would like to comment. Apologies, I'm playing with two uh, two mice here, and the one got the <laughs> wrong one. Um, yes, what one of the things I wanted to address, and I think it goes back to a little bit of the um, recreational carrying capacity, is that the policy direction consider cumulative environmental and social impacts. I think when we're talking about development, um, yes, we're concerned about the environment, but we're also concerned about the people, and uh, I'd like to see that added to it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any? Oh, I see. Um, Lori? Okay, hi. Uh, sorry I missed the meeting yesterday, but I did listen in last night, so I think I'm up to speed on the discussions and I agree with a lot of the comments were, that were made particularly once with regard to protecting our natural areas and the character of our lakes. Um, with regard to uh, cumulative, cumulative environmental impacts, they can be extremely difficult to measure and I'm wondering if the consultants have any ideas about, uh, about how to go about doing that. I know that yesterday there was discussion about potentially modeling um, our impacts on our watershed doing a natural heritage strategy you know, all of which I support, but absent that, uh, how are we going to actually measure the cumulative impacts of, uh, of development? Um, I could uh, uh, give a first shot at an answer. You're, you're quite correct, Laurie, that in order to gauge environmental impacts, you need to have a fairly good understanding of the environment that we're in. And in the next policy direction, we'll be talking a little bit about watershed planning as an example of the type of planning that could be done to inform uh, the consideration of cumulative impacts. You're quite right. It's, it's very difficult to do on a one-off basis. And I think what we're suggesting is taking uh, perhaps a baby step in this process and introducing the concept into the official plan so that it can be further considered. Uh, however, I do agree with you. Uh, it is difficult to uh, predetermine um, what impacts may be. Um, but obviously, the more information any planning authority has on the characterization of the watershed, for example, obviously helps inform future decision making. So um, that's where we're starting from. Uh, clearly, a lot to think about and discuss. Um, obviously, characterizing the watershed is certainly beyond the scope uh, of an official plan review and would clearly be a separate project uh, that would be carried out most likely led by the district because watersheds extend beyond uh, just the township. 
Uh, but that's a broader discussion item for sure. And if I can add to that um, for all, the, uh, the, the environment, when we talk about the environment, we are talking about the social environment, but I agree completely with, with Pat that we should put that in there. So here's some examples. Um, we require boating impact studies uh, and they say, well, it's going to increase the boat traffic by 10%. And uh, I believe the mayor was talking yesterday about what Foots Bay is like now. And I have been involved acting for the municipality on that on three different occasions where we had boating impact studies that say, well, it's just going to increase the, the boating traffic by 10%. Um, but no, no one ever considered what the cumulative impact of that was. We have environmental studies that say it's going to increase the phosphorus level in the lake by 2%. And then the next one says it's another 2% and another 2%. And so we need the baseline data to say, well, wait a minute, at some stage in the game, these small cumulative impacts are too much, but we need a policy in the plan that, that tells us that that's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Roberts, please. Madam Chair, um, I just have a couple quick com comments um, on the um, little group that we put together as councillors to to look through the um, the directions, um, we 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 were very supportive of uh, cumulative environment and now social impact studies for, and but our 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 summer up by point is we it's going to be very challenging to know when we have a problem, and as well as as implement a process to collect the details that allow us to get to that decision, and implement and implement a mechanism to monitor the cumulative impact. And to move forward on this, if we have a policy, the township, uh, township of Muskoka Lakes councillors must put aside uh, funds to make sure that this gets implemented in a timely manner. And that we have the, and we have to focus on the processes and the modeling. And, and I think that will need to be done by an expert uh, engaged by the township because we can we encourage with what the district was do, but it'll be the township that'll have to actually do the work to do the measurements. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nishikawa, please. Ruth, your hand is up. Um, you're still muted. I actually couldn't hear you, sorry. Um, my concern about, about, about this discussion is that it can go much further. So I agree what Councillor Roberts was saying, um, as well as um, the impacts on humans. For instance, if someone chooses to blast for six months of the year, uh, on a property and how that affects other property owners. Um, we have heard many, many stories. Of Ruth, if you can hear me, could I ask you to turn off your video because you're freezing on us here. And unmute because you're muted. Sorry. Um, essentially, uh, you know, we're having issues with property owners that are being affected by um, not only properties on the watershed, but uh, actions by others that choose to blast or fill in or do things for months on end. And I don't know if that ever could be part of this discussion or not, or where that actually would show up in a policy of some sort. Okay, thank you. I don't know if somebody wants to answer where, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, if I could maybe just get some clarification, we, if we put this in as a policy direction, we certainly moving forward have the option of 
delving deeper into it and, and need be doing an OPA. Am I correct on that? Well, I'm uh, just in response to that, my, my thinking is that obviously we haven't written the policy yet, um, but we would write it in such a way that it would allow for the consideration of cumulative impacts in the future, depending on the circumstance, whether it's boating impacts, whether it's site alteration, whether it's noise, whether it's boat traffic, whatever the case may be. We think it's an important concept that should be in your official plan. Uh, in, in response to the specific comment about site alteration and blasting, um, I do note that the township does have a site alteration bylaw in place. And there is a policy direction later where we'll talk about site alteration, uh, but there are mechanisms in place to control some of the things that folks may be concerned about. And we can certainly have a discussion about that uh, later uh, in this session. Okay, so I do not see any other comments. So um, if if uh, our consultants are good with this, we move on to the next topic, please. And Great. whichever one of you takes it. Okay, thank you very much. I'll uh, look after the next one. So the next one deals with watershed planning. It's uh, policy direction number six. Uh, we're certainly very familiar with the uh, Muskoka River Watershed White Paper that came out in uh, January of, of, of this year and its many recommendations um, that they made about characterizing the watersheds, um, getting better information on what we have out there in terms of natural features and areas and, and I think certainly uh, going in the right direction. Um, there are uh, policies on watershed planning within the district plan as well. Um, I always like talking over dogs, that was cool. And, uh, um, and there are um, increasing um, uh, calls for a broader watershed planning to deal with flooding issues as well. And, and the district is certainly uh, taking that, uh, taking a very proactive approach to that and has been updating uh, the floodplain mapping as you've all been aware. Um, I, I think the implications of that mapping are quite significant, but that's another, another discussion. Typically, in, in my experience, watershed plans are, are prepared um, in areas where extensive growth is, is anticipated, um, i.e. in areas around the greater Toronto area, uh, but they can be very uh, lengthy processes uh, involving quite a number of resources and taking lots of time. Um, I understand that a number of steps could be taken to build a watershed plan or build a better understanding of our watershed. And certainly those are things that can be initiated by the township or the district at any time. Um, so what we're suggesting uh, in terms of uh, a policy direction is that we set uh, the stage uh, for uh, watershed planning in the township um, as a means of getting a better handle on our environment to assist in understanding impacts and to assist in reviewing applications in the future. So again, it's, it's fairly high level, what we're suggesting. Uh, again, we haven't written out the policy, but we do have some ideas in here uh, that we would like to uh, suggest. Um, so essentially at the end of the day, we're looking to introduce some new concepts and this is one of them into the official plan. And uh, I'm looking forward to any comments or discussion folks have on that. Thank you. Um, Patricia? Thank you, Madam Chair, again. Um, of course, this has uh, been my life for the last uh, couple of years. I would like to suggest there's something um, very practical that might be included in an OP, and that would be a policy to for council for um, development proposals to actually consult with neighboring municipalities if the watershed, if that is relevant to the site. Um, I'm thinking going down to Georgian Bay, uh, certainly Gravenhurst, uh, Bracebridge, there are areas that expand beyond our township as has been noted. And of course, there are areas that expand beyond our district. So this is a huge project. 
but at least if we have a policy to acknowledge that we're willing to collaborate with other municipalities, it would uh, foster this, uh, this process of integrated watershed management. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Liz. You need, you need to unmute yourself, Liz. Thank you very much for the reminder. Um, I just wanted to confirm that the position paper from the Muskoka Lakes Association did reach uh, Director Pink yesterday and that that will be forwarded to the consultants. Um, this watershed issue is a very important one to our members. It's been identified that we would like to see the policies in the Muskoka official plan expanded and that we encourage the Township Muskoka Lakes to embed these policies into plans um, that apply to applications at any scale. Um, and also we would like to see the principles of watershed planning be applied as a requirement of any major redevelopment and uh, to do what we can about comprehensive planning and integrated analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, I did forward on to uh, Director Pink the, the revised policy um, paper that I got in from Katie yesterday. So that will, I'm sure, make it to the consultants if it hasn't already. Many um, yes. Um, Lori? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will echo that, that the Friends of Muskoka strongly support the development of more detailed policies on watershed planning than those that are in the current Muskoka official plan including you know, state-of-the-art stormwater management, low impact development um, policy and techniques, uh, green infrastructure. There's a lot of municipalities that have uh, taken these issues to a, a higher level than we have. And I think that we can learn a lot from them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we all received or directed to the mayor uh, a letter from the uh, Muskoka Watershed Council offering to um, assist with the OP. I think we should take them up and accept their uh, their their offer, and um, and we should maybe ask them for proposed policy directions that they think we should have, and this should be done prior to um, conclusion of the of the document that's going to go out to the public. Uh, thank you, uh, Bob. Just a quick comment on this. I think a, a, at least the site development side of this, um, there's probably commercial scale and individual residential scale. And I'm supposing we'd be addressing those things with sort of the same concepts, but um, maybe decision-making at different levels. I, I will point out that we had, um, a requirement uh, not too long ago and for several years where we had to go out and get uh, to develop a, a residential site that was a new build, we'd have to go out to consulting either um, uh, Riverstone or, or I think it's Beacon uh, in town. Uh, and David, you might want to comment on when we put these requirements in place to go out to consultants, I think the concern that um, planning was getting is that on in many occasions, what we were getting were basically carbon cookie cutter reports that were costing three to five thousand uh, dollars. They'd, they'd come in from various consultants and basically they'd change the address. And frankly, what ended up happening is I think uh, planning has decided to remove that requirement. And and actually, they started implementing uh, stricter uh requirements at the township level so i would just i would just caution that we don't repeat what we've seen in the past and and i agree let's get something uh let's get something into uh the planning procedure or the site plan process um but not necessarily have to go out for consulting reports each time thank you uh director pink thank you uh for that uh, just quickly in response, I think that's uh, more directly related to the uh, Lake System Health uh, 
direction that we were discussing yesterday. Previously, the township, uh, as per the Lake System Health Program at the district level, did require water quality impact assessments uh, for vacant lot development and new lot creation. Um, Summer, I think, can uh, confirm for me, but after many years of that program and reviewing many of those reports, uh, the recommendations were largely consistent. And the new updated Lake System Health Program essentially takes those recommendations that we've seen from those uh, uh, approximately 10 years worth of reports, and we have embedded those as standard uh, practices in the district plan. And we have been doing that in our uh, individual township site plan agreements for uh, a little while now already. Um, so uh, don't want it to be implied as if we took a step back. Uh, we've basically taken what we've learned and applied it across the board a little more comprehensively. I'd also like to uh, just uh, supplement what uh, David was indicating. I, I've been learning over the last little while that the township has also been very proactive uh, through the site plan uh, process in terms of dealing with stormwater management issues and low impact development as well and has been making a very concerted effort to work with landowners to minimize uh, the impacts uh, and the scale and footprint of development wherever possible on a lot by lot basis. And my assessment is that to a large extent, the township uh, from an operational perspective is already doing many of the things that we're suggesting be incorporated in policy. Uh, that's my take uh, based on my understanding of, of, of where we are, but it's always good to have a policy document to provide that guidance. And uh, so we're certainly very supportive of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob, do you like to speak again? Yeah, sorry, just really quickly in response to David, it, it certainly wasn't a negative. It was more a, you know, actually that we, it, it appears that, uh, after collecting data, and, and maybe maybe that's the answer, you know, five or 10 years of getting stormwater management or whatever process we're looking at, getting consulting reports, et cetera, from, uh, you know, to develop a site um, so as to educate, you know, what we need to put in versus just making a decision in the next, you know, in the next OP without gathering the information. So uh, it appears that's what happened in the uh, water quality assessment process. And I think that's, Fantastic if on an individual residential basis or uh, community basis, if, if we're providing those reports and then we're able to convert those into policy, I think that's maybe that's a direction we should think about. Thank you, uh, Pat. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd, I'd just like to reemphasize that watershed planning is more than just water. We talk a lot about the um, site plan requirements for watershed, waterfront development, but we don't talk a lot about it off the waterfront. And I think the concept of integrated watershed management is to really make sure that we incorporate the value of our natural heritage that we talked about yesterday in terms of dealing with the watershed um, beyond the water the lakes, the rivers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I do not see anybody else wishing to make any comments. So if we're good with that, I believe yep. we could move on to the next uh, next item um, and whoever's taking that one. Great, um, that's me again. So that's policy direction number seven, uh, dealing with the community planning permit system and waterfront areas. Uh, we did have a good discussion on this with the uh, working group uh, when it was uh, raised. And essentially what we're suggesting in the policy direction is that we uh, establish policies that then enable the uh, establishment of a community planning permit system in the future. Uh, it doesn't say it will be prepared or not be prepared. We're simply suggesting that it be introduced as a concept. Uh, that could be considered uh, in the future by council. Um, just for the purposes of review, a community planning permit system is a relatively new system that's modeled on uh, how planning occurs in Western Canada, primarily through development permits. 
It used to be called development permits. Lake of Bay, uh, Lake of Bays has a, uh, a community planning permit system in place now in the waterfront area. The town of Innisfil recently went through a similar process for its shoreline area. Uh, the planning process essentially replaces the site plan and minor variance and zoning process all into one. And there are a number of benefits um, to going down a different road from a process perspective, but there are also some disbenefits as well. We're not suggesting we get into a big debate about the merits of such a system and whether it makes sense in the township. I think what we're suggesting is that we introduce the concept into the official plan and have that conversation later uh, when uh, a determination is made on how you're going to implement the new official plan we've prepared for you. Um, and typically that's done when you're thinking about the zoning bylaw and you have two roads to follow. Update your zoning bylaw in a standard uh, uh, way or you introduce a new system into the waterfront uh, area. And that probably wouldn't happen in terms of a discussion item for probably a couple of years. So simply the uh, policy direction involves uh, uh, enabling it uh, in policy and having that decision made later. Okay. Comments or questions? Thank you. Um, uh, Liz, see your hand up. Thank you. It's a question about process that I have. Um, do we have to include the provision for a CPPS in the official plan to allow a future council to institute it? Or could a future council simply introduce the system even if it isn't in the OP? There, there is a need for enabling policy in an official plan to allow for a community planning per, permit system to be established. Um, so if, if we didn't uh, include enabling policy, then there would be a need in the future for an official plan amendment and the process uh, to follow to establish the system itself. Not really a big deal, uh, but if we can save a step uh, now and include some enabling policy, then then that, that step uh, saves time later if that's what the township wants to do. Okay, thank you. Um, Lori? I worry a little bit about adding enabling policy. Um, it may be interpreted down the line by you know, the next council as um, an endorsement of such a system. And it's not something that we have looked into closely. Uh, I, I don't think that many um, Councillors are, are even aware of what a community planning permit system is. It's, this is probably the first time it's been introduced to them. So I, I just, uh, it, it worries me that we might be adding something that could be um, interpreted as, as an endorsement. Um, and we may determine that it, you know, further down the line that it's just not where the direction that we want to go in. Uh, and, and further other councils might say, well, that council thought it was a great idea. So they put it in the OP. So maybe we should uh, seriously consider it. That's, that's my two cents. Hey, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have no basic problem with uh, enabling the, uh, the OP uh, to look at this in the future. However, I feel very strongly that our efforts in the next short period would be much better spent in updating our resort policies generally and for Manette in particular, before we spend time on this system, which is my limited understanding, uh, is a streamlined way of uh, delegating things to staff to follow established policies. So we need to have clear definitions and policies first, especially in the waterfront areas and especially with resorts. So I kind of agree with the last speaker that by putting it in, we might be taking our eye off the ball. I'd rather uh, see us focus the time on the areas where we know we have trouble right now and LPAD has borne that out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I am familiar with uh, the system at Lake of Basin. I would encourage a council or committee to look at that further. Um, I understand we have a, an issue up in Manette and things, but I do realize that we should be identifying, not identifying, we know what the problems are. And 
I, I would encourage looking at the Lake of Bays model because it's not a bad model. I'm just suggesting that we don't close our mind off to this at this time. I think a quick response to some of the comments already made is that we can certainly write the, the policy in such a way that it doesn't come across as being pro or con. It simply enables the consideration in the future so that uh, we wouldn't be creating a circumstance where uh, somehow tacit approval is being given in principle to establishing such a system. We're just thinking it saves a step if the township wants to go down that road in the future. So we would write it uh, in such a way that we don't tie anybody's hands either way. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards? Thank you. Um, can I ask Nick there? So you're saying that the community planning permit system that could replace site plan approval and uh, community adjustment uh, minor variances? That's correct. Um, so essentially the community planning permit system once established also includes uh, standards uh, but it also includes within it um, pre-approved variances to those standards that can be considered at the staff level without having to go through a formal process. The basic premise of the system is that it provides more flexibility to consider um, each site on its own merits. Um, when the zoning bylaw says that the setback should be X meters, it applies everywhere, but it may not make sense on every property. And when you do the community planning permit system, you, it allows for staff to vary requirements on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, it, obviously, in, in, in the hopes of advancing good planning on that property and, and in the area generally. Um, so it is a streamlined process for sure. It does uh, provide a staff with more of an ability to make decisions and it does uh, reduce the workload of the Committee of Adjustment uh, significantly. Okay, thank you very much. I would have to, to well, look into it. I think the system we have right now is working very, very good. Uh, if we straighten all our uh, policies up, uh, then they can be handled that way. So I, I would have, have reservations. I, I think I would uh, uh, agree with uh, Lori Thompson on this one. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you. Um, like Mr. Shikawa, I, I am familiar with the community planning system. I uh, have attended uh, some presentations on it uh, at AMO conferences. And um, I, I think to be understand where we may go in the future or may not go, that's a future decision. But to limit ourselves now, we're looking at our official plan. We're trying to put policies for the next five, 10 years in place that may or may not help us. Um, and, and I appreciate Councillor Jagwitz. Yes, we have other work to do, but we're looking at a broad spectrum right now on a number of things. So uh, this certainly doesn't take away from any other work. It doesn't uh, force us down a hole. All it does is it potentially opens a door should in the future we decide to make a change versus having to have an, a bigger hurdle with an official plan amendment in the future. So uh, I support this going forward as a framework without uh, uh, direction to implement. Thank you. Uh, Pat, please. Thank you for that. I would support um, Mayor Harding in that um, comment. And I would suggest, given that Lake of Bays is now looking at applying it to its rural areas, that we might want to incorporate the option because they've, they've lived with it now for close to 10 years, I would think. And obviously it's worked well and so well that they're considering expanding it. So I think if we're, if we can come to an agreement to uh, offer it as an option within our OP that will last for quite a while, then maybe it would be worthwhile to consider adding not just waterfront, but um, a community permit system, period. Okay, thank you. Um, Liz? 
Thank you for letting me speak again. Um, when we sat in the working group, we did clarify a couple of points on this community permit uh, planning system. The first is that it, it has been around for approximately a decade and very few municipalities have adopted it. Um, so it's not widely used and it is more applied usually to homogeneous, um, potentially urban settings. We realize that Lake of Bays has adopted it, but they have uh, far fewer properties and fewer planning applications. Uh, one of the concerns would be that this would take uh, ideas of variances and whatnot out of the public realm. There wouldn't be any public input on those. And further, um, it, there are legislated timeframes for staff to respond. Uh, we clarified this with Mr. Pink at our working group. And um, so it would place an additional burden on staff to respond in a very uh, shortened time frame. Whereas we already have site plan control that may already address uh, some of these issues and traditional zoning, of course, addresses a number of these issues. So I do think it requires further study. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I did spend some time uh, last evening and this morning going through the CPPS uh, background information. And I, 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 and then I listened to what was said this morning, and I, you know, when you're when you're in business, you don't limit yourself on an idea that potentially ha could could work. So I'm on the on the side of seeking more information on this, and maybe we we can get that information before um, we. Um, go to public cons consultation. But whatever we do, I agree with uh, Lori and, uh, and others that we really have to make sure that any policy, and Jim, you brought it up, you said you, it could be written. So it, it, it indicates there's no, uh, we're not endorsing, but it needs a lot of further discussion of the, of the pros and cons, because we really didn't get into the, the pros and cons. And I think rather just looking at Lake of Bays, we should look at other municipalities that have implemented it and, and at the councillor level ask um, what their experience has been with this. So that, those are my thoughts. Uh, so Bob, please. Just quickly, I think we're mostly all in violent agreement here, but I'd love to know what David would have to say. Um, you know, in our current situation uh, with Council not being able to uh, see variances or zoning bylaw amendments. I think if I was to put one in today, I'd be able to get in front of council somewhere around October, November. Um, so there are some, you know, obviously we're in unique circumstances. Um, you know, we're limited to dealing with uh, 10 items a month at this point. Other municipalities are staffed to be able to handle more. Um, you know, I think this is really, again, we're here to help our planning department. And I think we should be asking David, and I guess I am asking David, what would help you here? I mean, I think some of these things, we're, go we're going into these meetings with many times with staff support and staff recommendation of support, and then getting uh, rejected at council. And I also believe that sets up some legal challenges and legal bills that we're dealing with. So um, any way that we could simplify this process, and I'm not saying let's do it today. Uh, what I'm saying is we'd be crazy not to be, and this is where I think we're all in agreement, we'd be crazy not to be looking at an option on simpler matters to being able to let staff handle and more complex matters to get kicked upstairs. Thank you. Mr. Pink? Thank you, Chair Bridget. Um, you know, admittedly, uh, I'm not overly familiar with the community planning permit system, and I think some more research uh, certainly would be valuable. Um, I think I can honestly state, though, it has concerned me that it has been available to Ontario municipalities for quite a few number of years, and there has been quite limited uptake of it, uh, say for some, uh, I think as Liz Lindell pointed out, uh, some more urban uh, homogenous type areas so that that has uh, concerned me but I think I think it's a very interesting debate and I don't want to stifle it in any way but I think just in the interest of perhaps moving this along um, it seems like 
the group is a little bit split on, on how to proceed, um, flavor I seem to be getting. Uh, keep in mind, we're not approving policy today. We're not even approving any policy directions. We're simply going to the public and asking, and perhaps it may be worthwhile to leave this question uh, and see what input we get over the summer uh, from the community. Uh, well, whether, again, not whether we're implementing it or not, just whether the enabling policy is even appropriate or not. And I don't see the harm in leaving it as a policy direction question. And you may find the final policy direction that you uh, agree to later uh, this summer in the fall, uh, we strike it out or perhaps we leave it in. Um, but let's hear from the public. Uh, would be my two cents just to move this discussion along. Hopefully that helps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pinkham. Actually, I would agree with Mr. Pink's comments. So um, I don't see anybody wishing to speak. So I believe that we will move on to growth management, uh, either Nick or Jim. All right. Whatever. Yep. So I'll jump right into policy direction number eight. Uh, this deals with intensif intensification within urban areas. Um, the uh, updated uh, District of Muskoka official plan uh, requires that Muskoka Lakes do certain things within its official plan, including identifying uh, the limits of a built up area and also uh, enhancing and improving policies within its official plan to accommodate and encourage more development within built up areas than perhaps may have been uh, permitted uh, before. Um, I recognize that uh, both Bala and Port Carling do not have much land left uh, for development. Uh, that, that's very clear. I think in the most recent uh, uh, information I've seen, there's about 60 hectares of land combined in both communities, uh, which isn't a lot, uh, but would certainly provide for some development uh, to keep the township going for quite a number of years. I'm also very mindful of the uh, recent uh, projections done for the district, uh, which significantly reduce That's expected. Yeah, I have to. I'm going to, but I want to send the picture first. Yeah. Which will reduce expected population growth uh, in the township uh, from 1,200 uh, uh, people over the next 20 years to 200 permanent uh, people. So that's not a lot of people. Having said all of that, we do think uh, that the urban center policies in the official plan need a refresh and an updating and an update uh, to incorporate uh, best practices uh, in terms of urban design, uh, architectural uh, control, uh, making sure that new development is compatible with existing development and so on. And there's a list in this policy direction. Uh, the urban center policies are quite uh, bare bones in my opinion. Um, and can certainly benefit from uh, some more uh, enhanced policies to, to give you a little bit more control over the form of development. We'd also like to review permitted uses wherever possible to see where we can expand and enhance and add permitted uses uh, in appropriate locations to allow for more housing opportunities to occur. So that's part of this as well. So the policy direction is pretty, pretty broad and it really uh, speaks to enhancing the uh, policies that apply uh, to encourage more housing opportunities uh, within your urban centers. Questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, Pat, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like uh, Bob Clark maybe to address this as he's spoken to it um, in some of our meetings. There, if we're going to intensify in the urban areas, we're really going to need to incentive, provide incentives. I think we need policy to provide incentives to develop in those uh, areas because it is just not worthwhile for a developer to build in the urban centers uh, uh, under our current uh, situation. Secondly, I, I'm really concerned that in this um, description of building character, there is no policy on green buildings on encouraging uh, greener development, either in terms of power supply, the heating supply, the design, the green uh, roof. Um, all of those things I think would fit in, into this uh, policy as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes? Madam Chair, <clears throat> I think that you have to recognize that we are unique. Most of our development is going to happen in the water and then the urban areas. I think that intensification is great for um, multi residential but uh, was indicated there is not a lot of land and the land that isn't conducive to building unless you do a lot of blasting. Donalda, excuse me, Donalda, could I ask you to turn your video yes. off? We're, we're, we're losing you on the audio. So could I ask you to repeat what you've just said, please? Uh, yeah, I think that you have to recognize that Muskoka Lakes is um, mostly waterfront, but then, um, then urban centers. And most of our development happens not in the urban centers. Um, and putting design on just makes it more difficult for uh, developers to go in and build. And, and I think that it's mainly suited, urban areas are, are suited for development uh, for businesses and seniors apartments and multi-unit uh, housing that could benefit from being on service land. So I wouldn't like to, um, if you're going to intensify a sort of Okay, I think we got most of that, maybe not the last part. If you're going to intensify it, If, sorry, if, if you're list, looking to intensify something, it should be the rural development lot. Um, development on the waterfront is many lots now that can be subdivided, but there are still some. So, and our service area defines what our urban area is. Not a lot of development. Our urban air. Okay, I think we got most of that. Uh, is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes, no? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, then next I'm going to Bob, please. Um, just really quickly, I mean, um, I Again, I, I, I guess just bringing some reality to it. Uh, obviously, waterfront and being donated is going to be challenging. Uh, building a green building at the moment is much more expensive than build conventional building. Uh, I, I, again, I don't have a lot to offer. I'm building at five or six hundred bucks a square foot. I'm not the right guy, other than to give you some sort of clarity on some cost of building, but the cheaper the land is, preferably service. Uh, for most of the sites I'm dealing with, our servicing costs are, are massive. When you're dealing with uh, what our septic requirements are, water requirements, but e even if we go to some perimeter spot of vacant land outside of Ballard or Port Carling, um, we need massive, you know, you need wells, you need massive septic systems, et cetera. So, um, we looked at the Little Woodlands Golf Club up by uh, 169 and, and the Lake Joseph Road as a potential for putting in some multi-residential because it's, uh, you know, it had a little golf course we could create sort of like a little Florida community. And, you know, before we started building anything, it was at the point where a home was going to be, by the time we cited things, et cetera, and provided services, bought that land, it was going to be over $300,000 a unit and we didn't have a house on it yet. So, you know, I, I, I think there's just some reality to be dealt with and Mr. Harding can probably have a discussion with us about all the extra money we have in the budget to help out there.
Thank you. Uh, uh, David Scaletti? Yeah, I just uh, was thinking about you know, what we might laughingly refer to as the urban sprawl effect. And of course, we don't have exactly urban sprawl in the Muskoka Lakes, but we do want to encourage people, in my opinion, to settle in a town setting as opposed to on a lot somewhere between our villages or our towns. And it really comes down to supplying water and sewer to the greatest extent that we can. And I'm not sure that that really goes into the policy section, but it's certainly something that we need to be cognizant of. We, we want people to come and work in our communities. I think we want them. That's more of a strategic plan issue but we have to provide some space where they can afford to live. And I think that the best place to, that they can afford to live is in, in the town, as opposed to out where they have to put in a septic and supply their own water, et cetera. It's also, of course, the big concern right now about what's going on with the Balabay Inn. It's, I'm not sure how that fits in here, but it's, it's certainly a concern. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards, could I ask you to mute your, your microphone? Please, yep. thank you. Um, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I kind of look at this uh, uh, backwards the way it's, where it's stated. I think the PPS are quite clear that they want the development to take place in the urban areas. And I believe the theory behind that is, is to make better use of existing services. And there are hard services like water and sewer that was talked about. And then there are soft services like social services and uh, paramedics and health and so on and so forth. So, so I, I support this on the basis that the intensification should not occur outside of the urban areas. In other words, it's, uh, it's, I don't think it's proper planning to plan a satellite uh, uh, residential uh, setting outside of the two urban areas of Port Carly and Bala, since the growth in that area is not large, and 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 I'm under the understanding both their hard services are running at about 50% capacity, so so I support this uh, for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> and I was actually going to make the same comment. I know our consultant has their mic open as well. I know just to respond, but the more people I think who can turn their mics off, um, Ms. McDonald, when we're not speaking, I think helps for everybody. I know you said that about Councillor Edwards, so let's just try and be vigilant and or maybe have uh, Cheryl Hollows have a quick look through people's microphones and mute them accordingly, if that's possible. But in this particular case, uh, the reality is our urban policies are outdated. Let's look at them. Let's figure out where we wanna go. Plain and simple. So, 100%. These need to be dusted off and redone. So, um, agreed. And let's move on to the next topic. Okay, uh, Councillor Nishikawa. Sorry, tried it, but it wouldn't. Um, I have a lot of concern about here, mostly because I will say that while there is a planned subdivision for Port Carling, there are not feasible lands to build on in Bala. Um, and, but yet there are some very interesting properties, two minutes outside of Bala that could be developed. Um, and for attainable housing in particular. And I, I just feel that we are sort of, what I'm hearing is painting a lens that we're gonna exclude. We're basically gonna hope that everybody's gonna live in Bala and Port Carling, and yet it's not feasible at all. Um, and, and I hope that we can be much more creative and have be able to have this conversation further on, whether it's at council or whatever, because I recognize the constraints that we have here, but it's not something that we should not pay attention to because it is the reality of someone that wants to be able to afford to live in Muskoka Lakes, that doesn't need to be on water, and that in fact um, doesn't also require sewer and water. I've lived in communities I, I've lived in urban communities that are on um, on septic and wells, 
uh, and I just think that we could be looking at this much closer, but I don't think that we should expect that there will be any opportunity unless we are completely going to transform the lands. Uh, there's no, no opportunities in ballot for growth. If I can just respond to a couple of comments quickly, and, and I think to echo the, the mayor's comments, I think all we're suggesting here is we want to refresh and enhance the policy framework in the urban centers to potentially maximize opportunities that may exist. Um, there may not be much vacant land, but there are, is a lot of developed land and some of that land may be redeveloped over time. And it's looking at those opportunities as well. Uh, we're not really getting into how much growth is going to occur. All we're basically talking about is making sure that we're ready for any level of growth and, and making sure the policies are as up to date as, as possible. Uh, a few comments uh, relating to you know, rural development. There is another policy direction, direction coming up on rural lot creation where we can get into that particular topic. So I'm hoping we could agree that there's a, uh, it's a good idea to refresh. And certainly uh, when we come back with policy sometime in the fall, winter, you'll see exactly what we're suggesting at that time and have an opportunity to take a look at it. Okay, thank you. I don't see anyone else wishing to make a comment. So I think we can move on then to number nine, development in community areas. Yes, this one's gonna be uh, Jim's. Um... Okay. Yes, good morning. The Communities of Milford Bay, Torrance, Windermere, Foots Bay, and Glen Orchard have a single community designation. And within those areas, a variety of uses are permitted, including commercial, small scale, industrial, uh, and residential uses. Um, the policies in the district official plan um, require that we map the community areas, which we will do. Uh, but the policy direction that we're recommending here is one of uh, looking at the communities in greater detail and providing more policies regarding uh, infilling, um, servicing, and also looking at the, the range of land uses that are permitted uh, within those areas and perhaps actually designating different designations within the communities themselves. Um, so when I think of uh, places like Foots Bay, I know there's been a number of uh, uh, OMB hearings related to the expansion of the commercial service center there. Uh, I think of uh, all the communities have small commercial areas and some industrial uses and residential uses. And I, we think that there's a need to expand the policies to actually designate some of the areas within the communities to limit land use conflicts and to encourage those communities to continue to develop. Uh, and that's the basic direction that we're uh, recommending. Okay, thank you. Um, well, um, look, oh, no, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I didn't put my hand up immediately because I thought there would have been a lot ahead of me, but I, but I, uh, I feel very strongly about this one and I hope you allow me to, uh, to express it. Um, we just talked about urban areas. Now we're talking about community areas. And yet um, there's one area that we haven't talked about, which I believe should be in this category. It was in this category, and I think it should be moved back into this category. And so basically what I'm saying, I think there should be consideration given in this policy direction uh, that, that Manette, the community of Manette be moved back into this area with some special provisions to recognize its importance as a regional mode. And I think that follows along the, the concept of this. I think what the consultants are recommending that we take a look at the community areas, maybe put in some more media wording, and I think that would work. Now, I know the, um, the backlash to that is going to be yes, but we can't do that because the district official plan doesn't allow it. But there's nothing uh, preventing us to having a concurrent OPA at the district to allow this running with it. And in fact, I think as we go through our OP, 
here at the township, it's going to be obvious that there is going to have to be some modification to the district. So I'll go back to what was said earlier about um, the community planning permit. And it was, even though there were mixed feelings on it, it was suggested that it should be left in to allow the public the right to comment and then we can take a look at it at that point. And I think this is one of the issues. I think the public comment on where Minnet fits in, whether it's an urban area, a community, or as it is designated now as a, uh, I can't think what the current term is, uh, some kind of a resort. So, so therefore, I, I, I'd like you to give consideration to that. Thank you. So is this scenario we, oh, I see Mr. Pink is going to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just maybe a, a brief response. Uh, yes, there are district policy implications to that and uh, some may wish to speak to those, but I think as much as I, I do generally agree, um, you know, that generally there, there can be limited and no harm in getting some public input. Uh, I think we need to be cognizant that we've gone through a very lengthy uh, planning review process uh, as a result of the interim control bylaw. A steering committee was set up to examine that issue. A working committee, a working group is now examining that issue. Uh, and the draft official plan amendment uh, should be proceeding to council in August. Um, and they may or may not make that ultimate recommendation. Um, so I question, uh, I guess the wisdom of, of now uh, through this process, um, putting that as a potential policy direction uh, and sort of superseding uh, all the important work that's been done over the last uh, two years through those processes. So just something um, to keep in mind, I just thought I would clarify uh, those points for committee members' information. Supplementary? Uh, I'll allow one. Well, I think it's important because uh, I may have left something out of what I meant to say. The reason I'm saying this is that, as Mr. Pink is correct, the, uh, the Manette uh, Joint Review Committee has completed its work. We have a final report. Um, the committee that's the, the council. So, so I'm going to interrupt you, Councillor Jaglowitz. I believe this was going to be one of the discussion points at the end. And you clarified that you'd be allowed to, I assume, bring this up when we finish our discussion. So I am going to ask that you hold on to that until we finish going through these because we are off the major part of it right now. I, so, I will respect your wishes. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to request that Walker's Point uh, be considered to be put into a community uh, area. I've been approached by several business people and um, after public consultation, if there is uh, agreement, if we could look at doing that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Bob Clark. Um, again, I know as I can get into minutia, but just generally, yes, it needs to be looked at. I think if you talk to most of the marina and business owners um, on the waterfront, as an example, if, if we're saying marinas are part of this program, I mean, all I'm going to state is that um, we have uh, massive challenges now servicing uh, current island uh, operators uh, or at least island owners and most of our vacant land to be developed is on and the biggest problem is docking facilities. So um, I know there's a big uh, battle going on in Foots Bay. I don't have the details. What I can say is they're struggling to make numbers work and we're struggling to get people out to islands. So again, it's a small piece of it. I'm sure there's going to be much larger pieces to to the whole program, but it definitely needs to be reviewed. Okay, thank you. Mayor Harding? Uh, thank you. I support uh, community uh, areas being looked at in particular. I also support leaving Minette out of this right now. It's being handled already. Um, the only question I have is, and I don't see us dealing with it, do we want to update from a policy perspective 
um, our uh, industrial areas, Everly Road type of thing. Do we look at that as it's not really a community, um, but, but it comes its own industrial community. I'm not sure if it, where it falls and are we doing the right thing? Do we need more of those? So I just, I'm asking that question because we're talking about specific communities and it just seems its own community, though it's not a residential community. If I can speak, it's point number 12. Oh, okay. So, okay, so I'm, I'm just, uh, I gather Bob Clark, yours is under 18. We'll have more discussion about Marina's then. Okay, and thank yours you. Is, and yours is number 12, Mayor Hardy. Yeah, thank you. I didn't, I, I got rural contractor yards outside of the industrial area, but that's okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, Pat, would you like to? Yes, thank you, Chair. My, my question relates to process. Um, the, there's the use of the word appropriate, and I'm never quite sure who determines what is appropriate. Um, there have been references to public consultation uh, for each of uh, Torrance, Glen Orchard, etc. There's going to be public consultation as to what they want in their community, or how is that appropriateness going to be determined? Just a point of clarification, I guess. All right, so Mr. Diamond, do you want to answer that? Sure. As we do the draft official plan, there's a, a very significant public process uh, related to that. At that stage, we will have prepared maps uh, showing the community areas and uh, provide recommendations on how they be designated. And uh, at that stage, that information will be available to the public and hopefully live, but also online. And we'll, uh, we'll ask people what their thoughts are. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more comments on this section. So um, rural lot creation, who, who, whoever that one is. <clears throat> I'm back for that one, uh, Madam Chair. The issue of rural lot creation uh, started off when we were reviewing the official plan with staff and identifying where there were problems with the official plan. And certainly the rural lot creation policies are very complex. I think there's currently five different sets of policies uh, related to where you can and can't create lots in the rural area. It's too complicated, it needs to be simplified. Uh, at the same time, um, the policy doesn't really provide much direction for where those lots should be created. And we think that there could be better policies for where rural lots are uh, appropriate and desirable and limit municipal servicing costs and other issues. Um, the policies can, we can update the physical and environmental criteria for creating rural lots, um, but also recognizing that uh, with the help of the district, we determined that there's currently 900, 892, but 900 existing vacant lots on year round road access in the township. And with a growth projection of 200 persons, permanent persons to 2036, we really don't need to be creating a lot of lots in the rural area. And so we think that as the last recommendation that we should establish a maximum number of lots that can be created in the rural area on an annual basis uh, in order to limit rural lot creation in accordance with the district plan and the provincial policy statement. Um, okay, uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and this has nothing to do with resorts. I, I, I'm not expressing my opinion here, I'm expressing one, one of the, I have a constituent who's very adamant about this subject. I'm not sure I agree with him, but I said I would express it anyway. His belief is that there is lots of rural land that is uh, on major roads and highways and accessible. And if there was a better mechanism, it might be a candidate for some affordable or attainable housing. And uh, he's not talking about uh, multi-use. He's just talking about very inexpensive piece of property that, that someone can, uh, can build a homestead on. So I, I, I said I would express it and I have. So just for, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes. All 
All right, thank you. Um, I would totally disagree with limiting the development in the rural area. I know that uh, the last three developments that I'm aware of out, out this way um, were to allow for generational homes. It's a property that's been owned by the family for a number of years. And now the children are coming back and wanting to live in the area and the grandparents are severing off acreages, large acreages, so that they can come home, so that they can work here and become um, members of our community. <clears throat> and I think by limiting development in any one area to a specific number is, um, is not fair. Uh, I think that we have to look at development as <clears throat> something that happens through the wants and needs of the people, not by the numbers that were brought down by a study. And uh, also, I think that one of our major um, assessment increases are going to be seen in large estate lots. And I would hate to see that encumbered by us only being allowed to uh, develop limited, less only being allowed to uh, develop limited land use. Okay, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I agree with um, Councillor Hayes. Uh, people have been had the right for as long as I can remember to have two lots off a, a farm and that it's for retirement uh, and that uh, I don't think we should be legislating somebody's rights away just because we're, we're doing a study. And I think it's something that, as you said, the, the family can come back to the, the original homestead. I think it's always been a, a good thing. And I'll tell you, it's still allowed on a better farmland that we have up, up, up here. So it does keep uh, the agricultural land in, intact in most cases. We could maybe look at lot sizes for, and offer them to an acre and a half to two acres or something along that line, but I, I would not take that right away and I would be completely opposed to that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob Clark, Mr. Clark. Uh, again, just in support of Donalda, I mean, I'm showing properties in Huntsville today because there's nothing to show around uh, Port Carling that are million dollar plus uh, country homes, a uh, couple of acres, a uh, few thousand square feet. We don't have anywhere to do that near Port Carling that I'm aware of, uh, or nobody is doing it uh, because we're limiting large parcels to be only uh, severed into, uh, into large parcels. That also limits, again, your raw land cost to be able to build anything. So, you know, we have areas like Ziska Road, Partridge around Bracebridge. We're talking about how do we, how do we get the population growth up around Port Carling? Um, that's an option for long-term residents. I neither necessarily support it or don't support it, but it should be looked at. Oops, sorry, Liz, thank you. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Um, the province has just recently, of course, enacted Bill 108, which I think will address the concerns of Councillor Edwards and Councillor Hayes. Um, we are being encouraged now to provide secondary dwellings on properties and the rural area would be subject to that provision. So if someone is willing to have their um, multi-generational living uh, situation, they could certainly build a second home on a larger lot and that would allow the rural lot owner to keep the property intact to pass it along in the future. So I think that this Bill 108 has really met the needs of rural uh, landowners to be able to have their families living on the property and to preserve the size of the lot going forward into the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pat? Yes, I have two concerns uh, about this. First of all, I, I agree there's going to be an increased demand for state lots. Um, that we don't uh, allow right now. But that raises the issue of fragmentation and brings me back to the environmental impact. I think um, to follow that, 
I would be extremely upset if the number of rural lots was based on an annual number because I think what you'd find is in January, you would have a whole bunch of applications for rural lot development. Just as after we went to 7,500 square feet, we all of a sudden had 7,500 square foot buildings coming up. So I, I do not support that. I do support looking carefully. And again, it comes back to the, the whole watershed planning idea at areas where we might restrict future lot development severances in order to protect connection areas that are important to, uh, to habitat uh, that we might identify as being important. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see anyone else wishing to comment here. So if we're good with that, we can move on to um, attainable housing. Well, I guess before we do so, um, the policy direction as worded does suggest uh, a change be made to make it more restrictive. And, and I think we're hearing from a few folks that there's uh, not much support for that. Um, so I'm thinking we can't leave it as it is written right now. Um, so we may have to further give that some thought. I, I will add, however, that the district's plan does require the township to develop a strategy for rural lot development that is essentially intended to minimize the number of lots, but there are many ways of, of doing that. And one of those ways uh, may be to make the, uh, the policies consistent in one way or another, but perhaps not take away any of the permissions that already exist. I'm just thinking out loud. So that's something we'll certainly take back and, and, and take a look at. Uh, but clearly the uh, direction that we've written now, uh, based on my uh, hearing of, of the comments, uh, isn't supported. So that's something we'll have to think about further. Okay, thank you. I see if Councillor Edwards wants to speak, but I would agree. I don't support it as it's, it's written. Councillor Edwards? Uh, yes. Um, the second home in that, on, on a, uh, a property does not uh, cure anything because now that the children come back, say the grandparents pass away, they can't afford to keep the whole property. But if it was severed off and they, they have their house. So that's why I would still say leave that, that policy alone and I would not support it. Thank you. Okay, so are we ready to move to the next item, yeah. which I believe is a attainable housing? Yes, and that one's for Jim as well. Okay. You might find conflict in me. Uh, providing a recommendation saying that um, we should reduce the number of rural lots that are being created and then telling you that I'm absolutely passionate about the need to provide for attainable housing uh, in the municipality. Um, I will just make a comment in, in work that I've done with the housing task force at the district. Um, I found that uh, on average it costs $600 a month to maintain a car. So when you're talking about trying to have uh, attainable housing in the rural area, uh, you have to consider what the impacts of having that housing uh, away from the services and employment is in terms of the cost. But in any event, um, our recommendation really is that we need to do everything we can at a policy level to assist in the development of attainable housing in the township and throughout the district. Um, most of you will know that there is an absolute crisis uh, with respect to attainable housing. There's no place for uh, young people to live and work in Muskoka. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, there are people, um, and I think Bob Clark spoke to this during our working groups, there's people driving from Aurelia, Barrie, even Keswick uh, to work here uh, because there's no place for them to live. And so we've, uh, we've suggested that uh, we really provide policies um, that direct growth to the urban areas for attainable housing um, that we allow higher density within the residential areas um, so, that, um, so that you can build more affordable housing in those areas, especially where there's full municipal services. And um, 
and uh, allow policies in accordance with Bill 108 that will uh, that will provide for additional units within a single detached dwelling. Uh, and the final recommendation is that the municipality consider as part of community improvement policies, uh, the ability, again, this is an enabling policy, but um, have policies that would enable the municipality to provide financial incentives for the development of attainable housing in the township. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody like to comment on that? Well, it looks to me, well, Councillor Hayes. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we do have an attainable housing committee right now, um, and we are looking at a lot of the indications that Jim has mentioned, um, including land leases and Habitat for Humanity. Um, a lot of attainable housing, multiple residential is, it makes sense to put it in the urban areas. Um, but as someone that has built a house in the rural area, um, you can build a house cheaper with water and sewer in the urban area and uh, your average year, annual costs will be less because you're not paying for water and sewer um, from the district. And there's a lot of people here that, that um, <clears throat> car share and uh, carpool. And um, I, I, I think that the attainable housing should be looked at in conjunction with the attainable housing committee. I wouldn't want to see two different routes going off, one from the committee and one from the uh, one from the official plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Liz. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I am in favor of this policy direction. Uh, to create more attainable housing. And I would like to also speak up in favor, particularly of item E, which would enable the township to complete a community improvement plan to provide incentives for the development of attainable housing. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I'm um, wondering, and I'm specifically thinking about Walker's Point, but other locations that I've 20 years or so. Um, was backlot policy dis discussed? Uh, you know, in, in the past, we, we would have a policy in place that says you, even though there, there might be a road and lots of property between uh, the water and a backlot, we would not allow those developments on backlot. And I don't know if that got discussed with uh, your committee. Uh, Jim, would you like to answer that? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's all part of the, um, the rural lot creation policies. Uh, we haven't really talked a lot about backlot uh, policies because they, I think that they're, uh, they work the way they are right now. Um, backlot policies, um, Councillor Nishikawa, if we were to consider Walk Walker's Point as a community area, then the backlot policies wouldn't apply um, because it wouldn't be a waterfront area anymore. Um, backlots are considered, backlot policies are considered within the waterfront designation only. Um, and uh, I, I think, and I'll let David speak, speak to this, I think the current policies related to backlots are working quite well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Pink, would you like to chime in? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna echo those uh, comments, the uh, backlog policies. We do have uh, backlog policies. They're in the waterfront designation. Uh, I think they're working fairly well. Uh, they encourage relatively low density development uh, in that waterfront designation. Uh, not uh, to my knowledge has the Attainable Housing Committee discussed uh, backlots uh, as an issue although I look to Chair Hayes, but I don't recall um, uh, that discussion, uh, discussion occurring in the past. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Yeah, just to reiterate um, with David, I know we have not discussed it, but now that it's been brought forward, uh, perhaps we have, it could be put on the agenda for our next attainable housing meeting. Okay, uh, Laurie? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Lori. Oh, sorry, I thought I had. Um, <clears throat> I agree with Mr. Pink that the backlot policy seems to be working quite well for the waterfront area. Um, I think it's quite dangerous to look at changing those policies and allowing development in the backlots, uh, particularly given the importance to all of us of protecting the environment of our lakes. And um, the, client, the scientists who've been telling us that uh, with you know, climate change, the quality of our lakes is going to be changing and deteriorating and we can't predict um, what development, additional development is going to actually um, do to our lakes. For, uh, so it's, it's essential that we not sort of open up the idea of, um, of additional development close to our waterfront. Okay, thank you. Um, Bob? Bob Clark? Oh, sorry, okay. I have okay, changed there you my are. iPad, which is a totally different way of dealing with it. <laughs> um, anyway, just quickly, uh, I think Mr. Kelly yesterday talked about affordability, being able to pass cottages along, estate planning, et cetera, et cetera. I'm completely in agreement with Lori Thompson's uh, previous comments. I will say, though, there are properties. I just owned one on Christie Point that had waterfront. And then adjoining to it had a um, had a back lot, which was part of the property. Uh, that is how some families are shopping at the moment to uh, to look at estate planning, et cetera, because at ten thousand bucks a front foot on Russell and Joe, uh, they're not going to be able to buy their neighbor out. They're not going to be able to uh, they're not going to be able to put other other buildings on their property. So so there are there are other considerations uh, when we talk about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa? Well, uh, along the same uh, uh, that just was mentioned, I know of properties that are more than um, more than 1,000 feet, sometimes closer to 2,000 feet, that families um, basically have had to, who grew up and, and homesteaded an area, have had to completely leave the area because they could not have their children uh, live off of the, the back lot, which was in this case that I'm thinking about is more than 1500 feet from the water. Um, and, and the reality is, is to anyone else driving by, they would wonder why isn't there a house on this property? Well, it's because of this back lot designation that covers a whole area. Uh, and, and again, um, takes away the ability for us to create a very basic minor, you know, 1200 square foot home. So I, I do believe that this should be looked at closer and that it's not just a blanket policy because it's starting to feel, some of the conversation feels to me that we're really trying to only deal with protecting waterfront and waterfront owners and that, that is very difficult for me as, uh, you know, someone whose family's been here since 1840 on both sides and all of the struggles that they had to do to create this area. And I sure hope that there will be space for my son and his children somewhere. And I think in some cases, the water, the back lot designation puts more restrictions in that doesn't need to be there. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no one else wishing to speak. So, um, Jim, are we good with that? I'm going to uh, okay. I'm going to take from our conversation that the proposals related to attainable housing are generally acceptable. 
I've heard more comments about rural lot creation in this section again, which we will have a look at as Mr. McDonald said. Um, but other than that, I think I'm, I'm pretty satisfied or it seems to me that the group is pretty satisfied with the recommendations. Okay, I don't see anybody saying no at this point, so I agree with you. Um, so I guess we're on to economic development and rural contractor yards. Yes, and I'll take uh, this one and hopefully this one is uh, fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, so when we first uh, got involved uh, with the process, uh, Mr. Pink indicated uh, that there, there are increasing demands for rural contractor uh, yards uh, in the rural area but there are very few policies in the township's official plan that direct where these uh, uses can go uh, and not go. There are some general policies on scenic corridors that apply, but they are quite general. And we thought, uh, given the expressed need for these types of uses, that there should be more direction in the official plan on where they should go. And we've even suggested in here um, and of course, we don't know where this would be at this point, but we've even suggested in our policy direction that through a further review, we could even consider pre-identifying optimum locations for these kinds of uses in the township so that uh, when someone comes to town uh, looking for uh, this kind of use to develop, uh, they can be directed to the appropriate location. So it's a very simple policy direction. We want to look at it further. Uh, we want to provide uh, greater guidance and better guidance uh, uh, for future uses, uh, uses like this. And, uh, and, and, and essentially, it's, it's obviously a form of economic development. Uh, obviously, jobs get created in these uses, and they are, well ne they are certainly needed in the township. So any questions or comments on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, David Scalati? Yeah, I just had a short thought. And, and Perhaps we just need a simple different zoning designation for these lots. You know, maybe that would uh, solve the issue. I believe Mr. Pink would like to respond to that. Well, just uh, hopefully very quickly, just to respond to that. I don't think it's as, we do have zoning that does permit it. I think the issue that I've raised uh, with the consulting team is there's quite a significant demand uh, for these uses. Uh, right now, we're dealing with it on a somewhat of a hodgepodge basis. There's quite a bit of pressure along particularly the 118 corridor between Port Carling and uh, Bracebridge, uh, but even along 169 to Bala um, for these types of uses. And you see them cropping up um, sort of randomly along those scenic corridors uh, because there's a lack of guidance currently in our official plan as to really uh, where they should go. I would generally characterize the current policies as supportive of rural commercial development uh, and economic employment opportunities. But I think we need some guidance because there are some impacts to neighboring property owners, uh, to aesthetics along our scenic corridors with these uses. Um, but there, there is a need for them um, and we need to appropriately locate them. So I was, uh, again, this policy direction hopefully is fairly straightforward and just looking to establish some appropriate policies as to where to direct these uses, what those criteria are um, and potentially even going so far as pre-designating some. We did pre-designate, I think uh, the mayor brought this up previously, uh, we did pre-designate uh, the Evely Road corridor. Uh, I think it worked fairly well. It's one of the rare corridors in our township that really has no residential development on it. Um, and a number of lots were created. And to my understanding, I believe all of those lots have now been purchased uh, and have been largely developed or in the midst of being developed. Uh, so that supply uh, will run out very shortly. And I think there will be more increased pressure uh, outside the Italy Rural Corridor to locate those uses. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pink. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Okay, thank you. Uh, could some consideration be given to allowing um, some development on rural properties actually owned by contractors where it could be well burned so it would not be seen by anybody but we have to look at this from an environmental point and an economic point do we really want contractors who live in um say hecla to have to drive to port carling 
to pick up their supplies and then drive back and start working from there. Uh, you're looking at security and other features. So I'm just asking if some consideration could be given to that. That's a very good point. And actually that comes up uh, in, pol in a couple of policy directions from now where we're talking about enhanced permissions potentially in the rural area. And, uh, you know, rural a home industry could include a contractor yard as a component, and it does in some municipalities. So that, that's certainly a consideration, and we can come back to that uh, when we talk about policy direction number 14. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pat, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm of two minds. I, I think there is a great positive for economic development opportunities if the township had a designated area to invite new industry and um, it might entail some sort of servicing, but I think um, clusters are, are becoming very popular and a norm and that appeals to me. However, um, in designating areas and to Donaldo's point there, I'm wondering if maybe it might be easier to designate where they are not allowed. Um, and that might address the, the reality of the situation that we're looking at and the concern about what's happening along 118 and, and the corridor into Bala. Um, that really is what's instigating this and maybe we should call a spade a spade and deal with it that way. Okay, thank you, Mayor Harding. Thank you. Again, I'm, I'm supportive, uh, I think, to uh, Councillor Harris' perspective in some outlying areas, contract yards, so they don't have to be driving. Um, and I think we already have it. it it's uh, It came up on Averly Road recently where there's like a, I think it's a 100-foot side yard setback because some of our zone properties are currently in urban settings and to protect the urban settings. So maybe there's policy direction that if you have large acreage, you're in a very rural area and you want to hold your own um, contractor yard, that you have significant side yard setbacks um, and increased buffers to protect yourself from the neighboring properties um, and keep them out of the urban centers at that point. So I, I'm looking for some flexibility, I think, in this whole thing. Okay, anybody else have any comments here? Right, I think, I think, uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. Uh, I think what we should look at with contractor yards is maybe letting them, them put some staff housing on them too. Because one, they're normally a business that's, that's finished by six or seven o'clock at night. So it, it's, a, it's a quiet time. It would give them some actual security and uh, obviously allow for some affordable housing. So it's just one of the things that we, we could look at. Thank you. Okay. I believe those are all our comments on this. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, we got some good direction on, uh, on this one. Uh, the next two, 13 and 14, are going to be gyms. Thank you. So the section 13 deals with um, agricultural uses. And, um, you know, we know that in this township, there are um, fairly large areas that have been cleared and used for agricultural uses for uh, a century or more. And the recommendation um, includes a provision that uh, would actually designate those areas um, as uh, agricultural areas in the official plan and preserve and protect them for future agriculture. I think, um, you know, one of the things that that comes to my mind uh, dealing with climate change is uh, as horrible as it is, it does provide more opportunities for agriculture um, than have existed. And along with all of that, uh, you know, our concern about uh, food security and, uh, and uh, living locally. And by, by that, I mean being able to uh, farm and sell food on your property and having uh, locally grown food is going to become increasingly important in the future. 
And I think it, it's a, a, a good uh, ecological step, uh, if I can use that term, to designate the agricultural lands that are here and try to protect them for agricultural uses long into the future. Okay, thank you. Um, I would just jump in here. I would agree with that. And I, if this is where we're talking about agri tourism, that's another area that I would like to see uh, uh, enhancement or actually have that designated as, as uh, a use for our agricultural lands. Um, Lori? Uh, I also, I agree with this policy direction, but um, I'd, I'd just like to add that to the extent that any of these agricultural areas abut or drain into or otherwise affect uh, water bodies, I recommend that we adopt policies that require measuring, monitoring, and limiting nutrient loading from agricultural areas into what lake, what lakes or, or rivers. Um, other lake areas have significant experience with this. Okay, uh, Councillor uh, Hayes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with this completely. And the more latitude we can give farmers to do things so that they're successful, I think is great. Um, however, I'm thinking back to a case that we had some years ago where the couple was ready to retire. They wanted to move on. They could not find someone to buy their farm for agriculture. So they proposed an alternate use. And there was quite a debate about this. Do we lose the agricultural land? Do we preserve it? And these people were caught in the middle. So I'd like to know if we could consider allowing a certain percentage of agricultural land to be used for alternate uses. And that could be um, uh, attainable housing. It could be uh, a solar farm. It could be anything like that, that would give them some latitude to get some revenue from their property other than agriculture if they cannot um, make the agriculture a success. If I can respond to that, I, I think the reason that I'm dealing with both of these things is that the, this section and the next section really follow each other. Um, section 13, we talk about, should we designate the agricultural land? Yes, I think that what I've heard so far is yes, that's a good idea. Um, the other part uh, we talk about in part 14 is the permitted uses within those agricultural areas. And our recommendation is that we expand the permitted uses in those areas to include agritourism, um, home-based businesses in the, uh, in the rural area. Um, the provincial policy statement has broadened the uses that are permitted within agricultural areas. And it's actually very advantageous to be designated agriculture because you can um, have uh, more types of um, agriculturally related uh, commercial uses on the lands to uh, make it more viable to protect the agricultural land. And I think that if we designate the land, then we can impose the more permissive uh, rural economic policies that are now permitted in the PPS and expand um, the uses that are permitted in those areas. Sorry, I don't see anyone asking. Um, I, I'm going to guess there's agreement with that, Jim, with what you've just said. So yes, we're on to short-term rentals. Or, or did, did we cover 13 and 14 in that one? We sort of did. I, I hope so. I, I, seem, I, I think everyone's generally in agreement. Right, and I, I think what I got out of that as well, going beyond the agriculture, is that there's an openness to consider uh, enhanced and improved policies dealing with uh, with rural, industrial, and commercial development as well. And I think we got that through the other comments too. So it goes beyond just the agriculture. So I think we got that. Um, so I'll move on to the next one, short-term rentals. I'm hoping this is a short uh, discussion before, as well. Pardon me. Before you do, I've got one comment, Madam Chair. Sorry, Councillor uh, Roberts, go ahead. Okay, um, I agree with everything you said, but um, I don't think there's many farmers in this or agricultural people in this room. And I, I'm, I'm aware that there's a, 
uh, the, the Muskoka Federation of Agriculture exists, uh, an organization of farmers in Muskoka. And I strongly recommend that um, before a public um, uh, document is, is completed, that we reach out to this, this group and get their input on these two areas. Okay, so then I, that's I, noted. I think that'll, that'll happen through the normal course of this as, as well. We'll make sure that there's certainly circular. Okay, great. Okay, moving on to short-term rentals, we've included a policy direction in here that basically says that a policy could be added to the official plan to um, provide the basis for the consideration of a licensing system for short-term rentals in the future. However, we do note uh, very explicitly that there is no requirement to include a policy in, in, an, in, the, in an official plan to enable the establishment of a licensing system. So, you know, part of me thinks, do we actually need a policy direction on this item uh, if we don't have to have it? Uh, but it's here and uh, for discussion purposes. Personally, um, it is a significant issue, um, but it's clearly not an official plan issue. Uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Yes, with your permission, I'd just like to back up to the last question. I put my hand up, but you didn't see it, and that was my fault. It was late. I just wanted to add and, and reiterate, uh, there seemed to be a general agreement on 13 and 14, but there were two conditions put on it by two, two members, and one was uh, uh, that there'd be adequate buffering from neighbors, and the second, that there'd be adequate protections where those lands are near water that could be affected by it. So I think the policy should... Uh, should include those, so it just isn't a, a, a free for all. And, and we got those, and uh, we'll certainly include some reference to that um, as well. Thank you. Okay, then I think uh, Councillor, uh, uh, actually Mayor Harding, would you like to speak to the short-term rentals? Uh, absolutely. Um, I know we have a problem with a few people regarding short-term rentals. I know there's been lots of discussion on licensing I, I will still say I am not in favor of licensing. I, I'm not sure what it adds to us as a municipality. I think it shows more of a, almost a money grab, depending on how we do things. I, I really think we just need to look at our bylaws and find more creative ways to have good renters because there are many people who do rent out their properties not on Airbnbs, not weekends. My neighbor, for example, has a tenant in there right now and they are great people, super easy, and they're not partying every night. So how do we solve the, the few? There's 2% there's of bad apples. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, again, if we don't need this in uh, an official plan, I'm just not sure it should be in the official plan. Would sort of be my perspective. I would vote personally to be taking it out at this point. And if we need to deal with it later, we can deal with it, but it doesn't have to be an OPA to put in a short-term rental program. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes? Uh, yes, I was just gonna say what the mayor said. I believe that it's our bylaws that uh, need to be updated and need to be enforced. And whether you go with a, 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 a licensing or not, everything is based on the bylaws and the enforcement. So let's get the bylaws right. And uh, I would suggest that we not look at this at this time. It should not be in the official plan because uh, we can always implement it later if needed. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Pat? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, I tend to support licensing because it is an income uh, issue. But my concern is not the partying, but the overuse of many septic systems. Ha I have an example of a, a home that was built. It had uh, three bedrooms, three bathrooms upstairs. It now has three bedrooms, three bathrooms downstairs. And it has had occasion where it has had more than 14 people in it. 
They've run the well dry. I have no idea what they did to the septic. But I think those kinds of limitations have to be, we're, we're talking about the bylaw and we're talking about enforcing it. And we need the money to enforce the bylaws to ensure that we can fulfill the requirements or expectations. So again, there is another element besides co people complaining about the partying. Um, and, and of course, it also goes back to recreational carrying capacity in, in terms of bringing in boats, etc. So I tend, I tend to support licensing, but I agree uh, the OP is, is not necessarily the place to, uh, to put it, but it gave me a chance to voice my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with mostly everything that said, um, uh, re strongly agree that this maybe should be taken out of the OP. Um, I recall that prior to um, being elected, this was a hot potato, uh, short term of rentals and the abuse of short term rentals. So I think that it, it is necessary and important that councils should soon, rather than later, um, really address this. And whether licensing is the way to go, uh, I think there's other solutions, but I strongly agree that we need bylaws that restrict the occupancy of a, of, a, of a property when it was built for a single family and there's multiple on the weekend stress on the, on the septic system that then pushes out into the environment. So we need that much sooner than later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. Uh, and um, uh, Without repeating everything that's been said, I, I'm not fussy whether this belongs in the uh, official plan or not. I suspect it does not. But this is a huge issue. Uh, as Councillor Roberts just said, this is an issue that, uh, you know, predates the arrival of several of us to, uh, to Council. And here we are two years in, we still haven't really grappled with it and dealt with it. It can't be swept away if it's taken out of here. It's got to be given a certain degree of prominence. Uh, it's a much bigger issue than just noise violation, as uh, member uh, Patricia Arney has suggested. I don't think it even remotely uh, should be considered a revenue generator. This is a matter of controlling behavior uh, to the expectations of residents who uh, expect, uh, you know, who, who have a certain tolerance, but expect behavior. Uh, both from an environmental perspective, but from a neighborly perspective as well. Um, the balance is the issue for me and the concern I have when you talk about licensing is it's a behavior that's easily taken uh, off the books and, and hidden and quietly done privately and uh, to avoid a licensing or a fee driven scheme. And then we really are left with nothing. And I believe we're gonna be talking in a few minutes about bylaw enforcement. I also think it requires a completely different philosophy and an investment in bylaw enforcement that we don't presently have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David Scalati. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. There you go. I don't wanna prolong it too much. I agree with most of what has been said. For me, licensing uh, gives the government a little bit more control. Uh, and, and for me, what, what people are really looking for, what the citizens are really looking for is someone to turn to when they have a problem. So if it's bylaw enforcement, great, but people are really frustrated and the only people that they know of that can possibly help them is the government. So you have to be seen to be doing something positive. Thank you. Okay, Liz. Um, thank you. That Altus report that was done on resorts and accommodations across the district, paid for by our township and Muskoka, um, showed that short-term rental segments expected to grow faster than resorts are, and they will then pick up in market share at the expense of resorts. So I do think this could, needs to be controlled. It needs to be managed and directed. Um, I'm particularly not in favor of properties being purchased solely for the purpose of being put out as short-term rentals. So I think some policy uh, would be beneficial. Thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. 
Um, I was at a conference and basically we were told you either have to license them or ignore them. So I th I'm for licensing, whether it has to be in the official plan or not, I don't know. One, you can have a cottage with three bedrooms. You can rent it off uh, Airbnb, you have 14, 15 people staying in it. Or if it's resort, uh, if a three bedroom uh, cottage would be six people, they have rules and regulations. It's overtaxing septic systems. It's overtaxing uh, uh, wells, as, as someone had, had mentioned there. Uh, there's no fire regulations or anything else like that. So I think we're going to have to look at, at in the future licensing, whether it's in the official plan or uh, bylaws. But our bylaws are not strong enough to to uh, to do anything about it at this time. We've been doing all of this for years now, and I think it's about time we, we took some action. Thank you. Uh, Lori? Um, I just, I, I agree with the comments that have been made recently concerning uh, licensing. I think it's a good idea um, to include it as a, in this official plan, even though it's not necessary to be in there so that we can uh, adequately address it in the near term. And um, uh, uh, Liz Lundell's comment concerning the Altus study, I was on the Minette Joint Policy Review Steering Committee and we had a lot of discussions with the consultants about um, short-term rentals and uh, the demand for those versus resorts. There's going to be significant additional demand is their prediction for short-term rentals. And so we as a municipality have to deal with this because uh, there will be a tsunami of people wanting to come up and, um, and, uh, and stay in, our, in Muskoka. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but I think we need to put in place some rules to um, have some control over it. Thank you, um, Councillor Jaglowitz. Um, so if I'm going to ask now, if you have something new to add, please add it. If you're agreeing with everybody, just a simple I agree would be great. I'm just trying to move us along here. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'm just looking at it from a different perspective, like in number seven on the community planning, we said it's important to have it in for future consideration. I think the same applies here, even though it's not necessary to have it there. It's our statement to the public that we intend to look at this and we this will give us an opportunity to get some feedback and will help us when we look at it. So I, I think it can't hurt to have it in, uh, although it's going to be a lengthy uh, bylaw discussion at some point. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bob? Just a quick comment and possible different approach um, versus licensing and policing. Um, maybe we only approve somebody like a Jane's Cottages and somebody that does this professionally. Um, I've actually had the experience of renting a cottage through Jane's uh, prior to uh, developing it. And um, when we had an issue, uh, they had very robust rental agreements, et cetera. Uh, she was a, we did have an issue with the neighbor. Uh, her professional people attended that issue at 1030 in the evening. Uh, let the people know that if they didn't abide by their rental agreement, uh, she had the authority to remove them. Um, obviously, I'm not saying make it a monopoly, but it's it's a different approach where we don't need uh, by law enforcement funds. Um, you know, if you wanted to potentially collect revenue from it, then you've only got a handful of providers that are actual professionals that could manage that. That's all I have to add. Thank you, Jim Diamond. I think. I just think worthy of consideration is that in the public consultation process that we've undertaken to date, this has been an issue that's been raised by the public. And uh, while I'm fully in agreement with Mr. McDonald that you don't really have to put it in your official plan, it's one way to show the public that you're actually listening. And I think that there's a lot to be said for that. And as um, as has been said before, it's enabling. It doesn't compel you to do anything, but it does show the public that you're listening to what their concerns are. Okay, thank you. I know Mr. Pink wanted to say a few words here too. Um, thank you, Chair Bridgman. Uh, just to provide a little bit of background and clarify, I guess, some of the comments. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm in favor of licensing either, but I wouldn't categorize it as a money grab or what we get out of it. I think you've, I've raised this uh, issue, short-term rentals with council, well, I think two, more than two terms ago, I saw this coming. It will continue to grow. 
Um, and the issue is, as we've said many times to council, you're a creature of the province and there's only certain um, authority you have. And we're ultimately trying to police behavior. And that's the issue. We can't, under the Municipal Act, pass a bylaw about behavior uh, or a good renter bylaw that we're looking for. So the, the benefits of licensing is educating those who have licenses of our requirements, but ultimately also the ability to take away that license that's the key that you're getting from a licensing bylaw. If you have a renter who is not abiding, you have that now ability to remove the license, which is the key. The, the other option though, is essentially, as I think uh, Councillor uh, Hayes raised, reviewing your bylaws, updating them, strengthening them and enforcing them. So uh, the really the take home message I wanna send, uh, and again, whether we choose to include this in the OP or not, Putting a policy in the OP enabling a licensing system isn't going to solve our problems. Uh, what will is enforcing our bylaws. Uh, so really the take home message I like to send, I, I'm probably not going to be your favorite department head, perhaps enemy number one at budget time. Um, but we've heard uh, earlier uh, yesterday's discussion, today's discussion, enforcement, 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 site plans, site plans, enforcing those. Uh, now with short term rentals, noise bylaws, parking bylaws, etc we need to invest in uh, actual boots on the ground and actually falling through on that and that takes a commitment from council uh, to do that so i'm just leaving a little bit of a breadcrumb trail here that you will hear me say this at budget time you may not be impressed with what i submit uh, but i think we do need to back uh, back that up uh, and that's my intention with my new role uh, to take this uh, quite seriously and head on and, and address it as i feel appropriate so just wanted to say those few things Thank you. Um, Jim, Diamond? I've already started, but I'll, I'll, I'll let, let Nick deal with it. I think we're, we've got a split, Nick. I don't know what uh, yeah, so your read is. I think we got a split. So I'm going to suggest that uh, we're going to give that some thought and uh, and uh, come back to you with, with our thoughts on how to proceed with that. I, I agree, though, that there is no downside in leaving something in uh, for consultation and to get input back. It doesn't tie your hands down the road. So I, I, I think I'm favoring leaving something in for now and getting feedback and then making a decision later on what you want to do. And, and as I've indicated a few times, there will be multiple opportunities for uh, this group to, to look at the actual policies when we get to writing them in the fall and winter of this year. So, so with that being said, I'm very mindful of the time. It's 12, 11 uh, right now. Uh, there are a, a few meaty uh, policy directions still to, to go through, and uh, I like hard caps, and our hard cap today is 1 p.m., and I'd like to finish at 1 p.m., so clearly we're not going to get through all of the policy directions today, uh, so I'm thinking that we stop here, and, um, and, and I guess throw it back to you, Councillor Bridgman, to see how we want to proceed going forward. Um, clearly, there's a, there's a need for another meeting. Um, I don't think it will take three hours. Maybe it's only two hours, and maybe it can be scheduled fairly quickly sometime next week with this group, and that's fine with us. Uh, but I wanted to turn it back to the group to uh, get some direction on how we wanted to proceed. I also indicated yesterday that we would leave some time at the end of this meeting to discuss any other issues on the minds of uh, the folks on this call so that everyone has had an opportunity to provide their thoughts and input. Even if some is not uh, directly related to what we're doing, uh, we did say that the, the, that the forum would be open for, for those conversations. And uh, that time is now, uh, Councillor Bridgman. And uh, so I'm gonna throw it back to you for your direction. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna suggest a five minute break. <laughs> my first my first direction uh, and so if we could come back in five minutes we will we will um, discuss where we're going from here thank you
Okay, here we go. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so Nick, I, I have a suggestion that for you and Jim, perhaps in the rest of our time left today, we could try to do 21 through 20, I think 26. I think it looks like we may be able to move through those fairly quickly. Um, and the other ones are a little meatier. So we thought that might be a plan if that works for you. Yep, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Okay, and then uh, I'm everybody get their calendars out because we're going to have, an, have to have another meeting. And I think it's going to be three hours by the time we finish with the discussion after we finish the formal part. So would Tuesday the 14th work? I know this is really short notice. How about a hand up if it works? That might be easier to. to I may have, it would have to be first thing in the morning for me. I have a, a one o'clock meeting right now with Minister Yakubuski. So, uh, well, I know it's uh, back to back. I might have, have early, a... I may have some stuff to get organized for that meeting, just so you know. Barb, do we have a library meeting at one o'clock on that day? I don't know. We don't have one during July. Or did we decide to? Did we decide to put one in? Um, Can I add something to the this? last meeting? We didn't cancel it. Okay. Sorry. Yes, Nick. Yeah, I was going to indicate that I'm running a workshop in the morning that day and in the afternoon, so I'm not available at all on the 14th. Let's start with you and your calendar. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Much better yeah. idea. Okay. Uh, would the 20th work? Yes, it would. Okay, how about the 20th for anybody have any issues with the 20th? Maybe I'll. Uh, do that. It would have to be in the morning because uh, we have uh, district council on the, the uh, 20th at three o'clock at the Zoom meeting. It's okay. That's does, does nine o'clock in the morning rather than 10? Can we start at nine on, mm -hmm. on Monday the 20th? Everybody good with that? Yep. We're in. That was actually easier than I thought. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, on the 20th at 9 a.m., I know I know David will send out a, a reminder. So, okay, so I, I think then we're ready to, to continue on and see if we can wrap up those last ones today. Oh, Councillor um, Councillor Roberts wants to say something. Okay, I agree with um, go, jumping to those, but I think I, I would like to see the um, the discussion on aggregates and Miller uh, number twenty two. I think it is be taken out of, of the conversation for today. I can't hear you, Barb. Oh, that's because I'm muted. Um, can I just understand why? Okay. Um, it's one of the biggest issues in Ward B that we have. And um, I believe it needs, a, it, it should not be rushed. We need to get everyone's input on that, all right? That's why I'm asking for it to be taken out. Sounds like a plan. Okay, so I guess we'll start with 21 and skip 22 and continue on then. So Nick or Jim, take it away. Okay, so 21, I'm, I'm hoping is fairly straightforward, but, but we are certainly aware and, and, and you are, all aware of well as well uh, of issues relating to employees working at resorts and, and where they actually are living. Uh, I have to say, I actually had a daughter that worked at Cleveland's house and, and lived at a, in, a, in a very terrible accommodation on a rented property. So I know it's a, a significant uh, local issue. And in thinking about it, um, and I know we're not really supposed to be talking about resort policies, but this one goes a little bit beyond. And we're suggesting that for new and expanding resorts, uh, that employee accommodation be provided on site uh, through the approval process up front, rather than having to deal with the issue later. I think it's an easy one, um, but we wanted to put it in here and uh, get comments on it before we went out to the public with it. Thank you. <laughs> so sorry, I couldn't unmute for a minute. Um, uh, Councillor Hayes. Uh, yes, we we do have some very small resorts that employ minimal staff that live in the area. Um, so 
could um, could our direction be that if you employ less than five staff, you do not have to have employee accommodation, or it's not mandatory to have employee accommodation? I think what I would do just to make this really simple uh, at this point is say for the larger resorts, and we can define that later. Um, but but clearly, it's for the larger resorts. We're not looking to penalize or or require things from smaller mom and pops that we don't need to. So so that's that's a fair uh, comment, and we'll add in the word larger somewhere in there. Thank you, Mayor Harding. Um, thank you, and. I understand this concept. There's a couple things. Number one, I'm staff housing is what we're trying to solve as a problem, but we have staff housing issues with, I'll name some companies, uh, SWS, uh, water sports schools, Muskoka Wake water sports school. We have issues with turtle jacks. We have issues with club link. They all have significant staff accommodation that they require. And so I guess my, and, and I, I like Danella's comment about, you know, fewer, we don't regulate whatever, but why, I guess is my one fundamental question, why do we single out resorts alone? Because if the issue is staff accommodation, and now they have, they build hotel rooms theoretically, so I understand that. But I will say that if we are going to mandate, um, hotel or that they have to provide staff accommodation or a proportionate amount of potential if I have a hundred rooms that 10 rooms have to be designated for staff accommodation but I would also in doing so I would hate to say this but I would try and look at affording them some greater densities in certain uh, parcels of their land to accommodate those staff um, and again I, I'm, I'm just looking at red flags and or legal implications of how we segregate just resorts because there's a number of other businesses that have a ton of seasonal employees, landscape companies. Old Loom Call had lots and lots of seasonal employees that come up here and want to work and those staff have to be housed. I don't know the answer. I'm just flagging it as a question as we write, write policy. You, you make a very good point, and I guess we did pick on resorts, admittedly, in this policy direction, only because we know that new and expanding resorts will go through a pretty rigorous Planning Act approval process of some kind, and it's through these processes that we can secure uh, enhancements or on-site accommodation or other things, so that's where our head was at. Uh, for some of these other uses that already exist, they probably don't need to go through a process. To, to do whatever they're doing now. However, I could be wrong on that, but your point's well taken. I think the focus is clearly on resorts, but we could expand that to say that for other larger uses, it's encouraged as well, but not make it as mandatory as it would be for resorts. Just a thought. Um, David Scaletti. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, for me, the whole thing seems like a bit of an overreach. I mean, how are we going to require uh, anyone who works in the resort to stay in the resort property? Does the accommodation that they're receiving count as uh, a wage? Are they going to be taxed on that? Is that a taxable benefit? Uh, and, and in my mind, it seems unprecedented. And maybe I'm just ignorant to the fact that other areas have done this successfully. But the uh, control seems way beyond what we would be able to uh, manage. My my thoughts. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Yes, thank you. Uh, and that through the chair. Uh, I agree with, with the Mayor Harding uh, that resorts uh, should be giving something uh, for their staff. In other words, that doesn't uh, count as lot coverage. So if you put a building up and have your, your staff there, when they, that way they can, they, they can control it. I know. Uh, uh, Camp Muskoka Woods, uh, they, they've had uh, staff on, on for years and it's worked out there. So I think it, it can be done. Uh, as far as other, uh, uh, other businesses, we'd have to look at that. But large resorts, if it's got, say, over 10 employees, should maybe be, be supplying some sort of housing for their staff. 
Okay, thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I agree with Mayor Harding that it's much bigger than just resorts. We, of course, in Bala have the obvious issue that uh, is of concern to everyone. It might be an opportunity for identifying a cluster instead of an industrial zone, a zoning area where um, high density housing could be provided for seasonal staff. And you zone it, everybody knows what the uh, potential is for that property. And uh, then possibly uh, a consortium of, of these businesses and they're they're hurting too. I mean, it's not just that we're hurting because uh, they're ending up in inappropriate places, but um, they're hurting because they can't get the staff. So I think that's an economic development opportunity that uh, might be able to be re re researched. Okay, thank you, uh, Liz. Sorry about that. Uh, I think my concern is that it that we take a look at if a business provides housing, then that accommodation should be on the property. There are a number of summer businesses that don't provide accommodation, and I realize that can be a problem for attracting um, workers. But if there is going to be housing, I think it should be um, well constructed. It should be managed. It should be supervised, and should be on the property of the business that's employing the people. That's the difference I would see. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to say I do support this. Uh, I do understand that this may, and I also agree with other comments that uh, possibly the, the the resorts or whatever the organization is maybe given compensate, not compensation, but credit for it should not take away from their ability to make money in their allocations, but I do support it in principle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so I don't have any more comments on this. I believe that the policy direction is, we agree with the direction. Okay. So we could move on to number right. 23. Okay, so I'm going to put number 23 and 24 together because they basically deal with, uh, with the format and organization of the official plan and its readability. Um, the current official plan um, is dated in terms of how it's presented, um, how it explains concepts. There are many, many good policies in your existing official plan. And as we talked yesterday, the good ones we're going to keep. We may reword some things, but we're going to keep them. Uh, but we're all also thinking that, that there's a real opportunity here to create a very forward-looking official plan as well uh, that not only contains forward-looking policy, but also contains forward-looking graphics and is much more pleasing and easy to use while still being defensible, of course, when we go off to LPAT to defend any policies. So a couple of things. Um, the district's plan is an updated official plan. There's a certain organization that goes along with that in terms of what comes first and second and third. And uh, as an example, uh, when the district's plan was prepared, a conscious effort was to put all of the big environmental policies up front at the beginning of the official plan to recognize the importance of protecting the environment uh, in, in the district. And we're thinking, that the format that was used in the district's plan should generally be uh, followed in creating a updated, uh, dis uh, updated township official plan. So that's one of our uh, recommendations. Um, we're also thinking that we should be adding definitions into the township's plan as well to assist with interpretation. And we're also thinking that we'd like to add in some illustrations to add in some, to, to basically deal with some key concepts. Uh, I'm thinking no one's not, no one's going to have a problem with this because uh, it, 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 it certainly would be a, a huge improvement, but we wanted to get out there so folks can uh, think about it and give us their comments uh, at this point. Okay, thank you. Anybody have any comments? 
I think we're probably all in, my guess would be we're all in agreement with what you said, Councillor Jaglowitz. Yes, I'm fully supportive of this, Madam Chair, but I would go one step farther. I think we run to this time and time again. I think all terms used in the official plan, if their meaning isn't generally understood or known or defined somewhere, if it's defined somewhere else, it can be referred to, but if it isn't, it should be defined. I think that just makes it a, an easier. You should be able to read this plan and understand what it says without having multiple things. So I, I support uh, that concept 100%. Okay, thank you. Um, you just take your hand down, Frank, please. Okay, oh, okay. Um, all right, so I, I think we're done with that. Okay, uh, moving on to the last two. Uh, again, these are fairly straightforward. Um, item number 25 deals with accessibility. Uh, there's increased awareness uh, these days of, of needing to ensure that all development is accessible. Um, there are some policies in the, in the district plan dealing with accessibility. Um, we're thinking that there needs to be, uh, I guess, a more enhanced policy framework in the township's official plan that requires accessibility considerations be, be looked at through Planning Act approval processes. So that's fairly straightforward. And I'll just lump in number 26 so we can deal with them both at the same time. Um, pedestrians and cycling. Um, we're also suggesting that we look carefully at adding policies that uh, take uh, pedestrian movement into account, particularly in commercial areas and industrial areas and obviously in the urban centers. There's an increased focus on cycling as well. Um, and in some circumstances, uh, we should be looking for and, uh, and obtaining, for example, uh, bicycle parking facilities when we're looking at site plans for commercial developments and, and employment uses as, as a very small example. Um, so those are uh, fairly uh, high level, but really intended to, to encourage uh, that we think about all members of society when, when we're planning for new development. Okay, thank you. I see Patricia has a comment. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, uh, I totally support both of these, of course, but I'm, I'm just wondering about their positioning in this presentation, going back to your uh, statements about reorganization. Um, I, I'd like to know, I think there's a better place than technical to, uh, <laughs> to have these uh, framed, and I'm wondering where they're going to be fit in. Thank you. So that's a good, a very good point. Uh, there was no implied order to how we put these together, but your point about these being technical issues is very well taken. So we will look at that uh, and 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 put that in a different context when we go out to the public. Uh, but good, great comment. We'll we'll certainly work on that. Okay, uh, Councillor Roberts. Very quickly. Um, I, I, I agree with accessibility and the pedestrian to be in a, on a different ca category, but I'd like to um, not, not get into today, but maybe next meeting, get into waterfront play toys and policies related to that. I don't believe we have any jurisdiction over that. I, I, Mr. Pink, can you answer that for me? I'm happy to as well. Chair, um, I think I, I think as some have been copied on, there's been some inquiries to uh, upper levels of government, um, provincial and federal, as to authorities, and I'm I am interested in hearing the responses. As uh, we don't currently regulate uh, water toys per se, they're not structures under the building or buildings under the building code. Uh, they are uh, floating rafts in many cases uh, that are really impossible or extremely difficult to police or or enforce. Uh, however, I will say that uh, we do zone our lakes, water body open space, and we do control docks and boathouses over them. So I, I don't think I would ultimately close the door completely that we could not try potentially to, uh, uh, to uh, regulate that type of activity. But I think uh, Council needs to be cognizant of the difficulty of doing that. And I'd like to hear from the upper levels of government uh, really confirming whether we do or do not have that authority. So. Uh, we currently don't, 
um, but I'm interested to hear those, uh, waiting for those responses. So maybe we'll have the responses by the next meeting, Councillor Roberts. <laughs> Any other, now your hand is still up. Yeah. yeah. You, you're on mute. Yeah, yes, sir. yes, it's I trying to click it. Yes, I, I, I think we'll get feedback, but we do regulate um, rafts, which is a play toy. So we, I, I look forward to more discussion. Oh, 16. Okay, so I just uh, uh, chatting with David here for a minute. He wondered if we could do 16 while we've got everybody here, which is shared workspaces. We knock off what we consider to be the- Before, before we jump, here. if I can just make a quick comment, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, even when we get back direction from the province on uh, water toys and stuff, uh, I, I would not be supportive. Um, you know, I mean, there's times, first of all, there's liability associated when you put something in the water and people are their own liable. But uh, yes, there's one or two places that have these things. Um, we have some commercial resorts that have these things. Uh, they're typically short lived while your kids are young and then they're gone and they move them on. So it's like a couple year window that somebody may or may not want them. Um, I'll just, I, I would be hard pressed to stick my foot in and say what my fun is or somebody else's fun and how they want to manage and is it because it's an inflatable toy now is it a solid eight by eight dock in a raft uh is it a hard plastic dock that i swim to that's got a little slide on it um i i'm just very cognizant i i know we all received that copy of one email from one individual so um that's just my two cents as we move forward okay uh councillor kelly <laughs> Uh, my only comment is, uh, as much as I would like to deal with these things, I think it's, you know, it's a sinkhole for money if we were to try and fight this simply because of the jurisdiction over the waterways. Uh, people are creative. People who want to fight for these things can tie us up forever. It'll cost us a fortune to find out we're wrong. So just a, a, just a heads up. Okay. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa. It's interesting that this is being raised right now as I spent 20 minutes with a, a cottager who has no access to their dock currently because of the large island floaty thing that is more than 20 feet in diameter um, that is actually touching this, these people's dock. And I, I just think it's kind of sad that our township doesn't want to or, or is there's some indication that we don't want to weigh in here and address it, but it is actually prohibiting these people from using their boat currently. And um, when I have reached out to the, to the federal government, because we, David and I had talked about this last year, um, and I, it, that was suggested to go to the federal government and everything else. Well, there still has to be some policy in your township was one of the first questions that came up for me. So I, I think it's pretty hard when, um, you know, people that have been property owners for years and years and years uh, now can't have access to their dock and we're not willing to venture into this area. Okay, thank you. So I'm not sure. It seems to me that this perhaps could come back to a planning committee meeting once David hears from the federal area. I, I know we have some different thoughts on it, but um, I agree with Councillor Nishikawa. If you can't get your boat out, that's really an issue. So uh, we're not we're not going to solve it today. I I would suggest we bring it back to the planning committee. Um, so shared workplaces, do we, we have 10 minutes, Nick, can we do that or, yeah. or Jim? I'll, I'll deal with this if I can um, and be short um, and dealing with it. I think that when we prepared our background report and this issues report, 
uh, we hadn't even seen the implications of COVID on retail and office space yet, and it's going to be significant. And together with our thoughts of the need to really in, enhance Bala and Port Carling, um, the direction was to broaden the uses that are permitted to allow current things, pop-up shops, um, shared office space, um, event facilities, and things like that. And I think there's even a greater need now to look at those commercial uses in your urban areas and provide the greatest opportunities possible, thinking of what the future will be um, now that I would say the commercial structure has been altered permanently. Um, and so the, the recommendation was really simply to think more currently about the uses that are permitted and provide the broadest range of commercial uses in those areas that we can. Okay, uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Councillor Kelly. Nobody's ever asked me to unmute myself before. Um, I, I'm a big fan of the um, of the uh, shared workspace, as you well know, Madam Chair. Uh, but I have to tell you that uh, in light of the pandemic, uh, businesses in the U.S. one in particular called I think it's called WeWork. Um, nobody wants to sit near anybody anymore that they aren't related to. So I think there's a huge challenge. We should probably remain flexible and leave it open. But all of the enthusiasm that I had for this business model five months ago went way out the window on about March 17. True, true. Um, okay, so um, Jim, if you, uh, I mean, we certainly wanna leave those options open and we'll see what the future brings. Yeah, I think that's fine. If we were generally in agreement that that's the right direction, that's all we need. Yeah. I think that's true. So, okay. Well, um, it's. Uh, I think. I think it makes sense to shut things down now, unless Nick and Jim, you have anything else that you want to deal with at this point in time. Not for me. I, again, I uh, thank all members and participants today. It's been a very, very good discussion. We've got some great input and some good directions. So, very, very pleased with uh, how this meeting has gone. Great. Well, yes, and thank you, everybody. There, I know Zoom is more intense than even meeting uh, in person. So thank you all for yesterday and today also. And we will look forward to reconvening then on the 20th at 9 a.m. And before we go, and thank you, thank you to, um, to Jim and Nick, and we'll see you on the 20th. And before we go, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Roberts, be it resolved that the Special Planning Committee ad adjourn at 12.53. All in favor? That carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Barbara, if I can make one recommendation, our next meeting, you know, we go for two hours and then have an hour, maybe do a break at about an hour and a half. Um, just, I needed a swim and it happened at two hour mark, but then, you know, an hour and a half mark would be better. And for those wondering, Lake Rosso is 82 degrees right now, three feet down. It's crazy. Three feet down. I know. And it was 82 and when no, I went in. Yeah. No such thing as climate change. <laughs>